Batu, selamat pagi, selamat sejahtera. Apa khabar semua? Ya. Yeah. So let's show your fresh and eager face. Can? <laughs> okay, uh, let's continue um, with our uh, first topic in uh, IMK 209, Physical Properties of Food. Uh, still, we are discussing uh, about rheology, yeah? food rheology. And uh, just to refresh uh, from our previous uh, lecture, we have defined rheology. Okay, so basically, rheology is a science of deformation and flow. Deformation means when we apply a stress. So let's use the term stress now. Because if we say the, uh, when we apply a force, we apply a force on uh, a given surface area. So the, the surface area can vary. So we divide F, divide by A, we get stress. So let's talk about stress now, okay? Um, the stress can be applied in uh, different directions, okay? So I have uh, given the link in a modo on uh, for on on uh, well, this one video to explain about the basic principles of stress and strain. How many of you have have not watched the video? So I guess uh, all of you have watched the video because if you have not watched the video, you won't be able to answer some of the question in our, uh, at the end, I will give you a quick puzzle in the form of crossword that uh, we will do it together. We will do it together, okay? So, um, I hope you have understood. Do you have any question about the concept of stress and strain? Everyone clear? Okay, okay. If, if, you're, if, you're, if you're clear, then uh, we can proceed. Okay. Um, right. So, rheology is about the science of flow, the science of deformation and flow. So, when we apply a stress, then uh, the material, it can be a liquid, it can be any fluid. Okay. Uh, the term fluid, F L U I D, fluids, yeah? it can refer to a liquid, it can refer to even a gas, yeah? something that uh, probably uh, can can flow when we initiate when when we apply a stress yeah so for a liquid when we apply a stress then uh, it will start to flow yeah so it will deform and flow okay so different materials would have would would exhibit or would show different types of flow behavior remember uh, in the previous lecture. Uh, I brought a few samples like tomato sauce, chili sauce, plum sauce, even water. What else? Honey. Okay. And we have demonstrated, I remember Aziza. Where is Aziza? <laughs> okay. We, I remember Aziza demonstrated to all of us that some uh, type of samples would uh, flow readily, easily. Some maybe not so readily. So they display different types of behavior. So now, uh, it's, uh, it is very important for us to understand the different types of flow behavior. So that's what we are going to learn uh, in this lecture, types of flow behavior. But I assume that um, from uh, you have watched uh, two lectures that I have asked you to watch. I've given you the link in Edmodo, and I hope, uh, I hope all of you have uh, listened and watched that, uh, those two videos. Those, those two videos actually explain about the types of flow, flow behavior, the same one that we're going to discuss today. So I hope uh, what, going, what you are going to listen uh, shortly is not something new. Okay? Um, so food, there are so many different types of Okay, uh, we can see here 
all of this is probably, probably very familiar to all of us. What is this? Maybe jam. Yeah? So jam, as we can see here, or, or spread, they are very viscous. Okay? They appear like, like a semi-solid. Yeah? So they don't flow easily. If you try to maybe pour a bottle of jam, maybe they won't flow. Okay? So you have to maybe use a spoon to scoop. Yeah? Just like this. So they don't flow readily. Even um, this one is what? Something like ice cream. McDonald's ice cream. Okay? And you can see um, it, it forms a shape. Yeah, it forms a shape and retain that shape before the ice cream starts to melt, of course. If, uh, when the ice cream starts to melt, of course, it will, you know. But it will retain the shape for a while. In rheology, in rheology, this type of property, ability to retain the shape, is called the stand up. Stand up characteristic. Ability to sort of stand up or retain the shape. So we can imagine if in terms of the viscosity of this ice cream, the viscosity is quite high or very high. What about the sauce? Look quite viscous as well. Juice. The viscosity may be not as high as the ice cream or the sauce. So it can flow easily. The milk. The dough. The dough has a very high viscosity. In fact, um, this is a type of uh, a type of food material which display viscoelastic property. Yeah? The term viscoelastic means it has some viscous property, liquid-like property, and elastic, which is solid-like property. Theoretically, any material actually are viscoelastic. But whether the liquid-like property is higher than the solid-like property or vice versa. Okay? So in this case, maybe the elastic property is higher than the viscous property, the solid-like component in, the, in this dough is higher, so it displays more like a solid. It appears more like a solid. It doesn't flow easily. You have to stretch it to make it, uh, to deform it, and to make it flow. And it's honey, very viscous sample. So from these um, examples, we can see different food materials would display different flow behavior. They flow differently. So we want to describe the different flow behavior in terms of the viscosity of the sample, of the material. Okay? And what is the significance of the different types of flow behavior? What is the implication of this in the, in the food industry, in the food processing, in the food formulation, when we use different types of ingredients? Okay? So the significance of different uh, flow behavior of the food uh, material during processing. For example, again, uh, this is a spray drying process to produce a milk powder. Okay, we have to force the liquid. It can be milk, it can be anything, coconut milk, something in the form of liquid. We want to dry and to produce powder. So we use a, a process of spray drying. So the liquid will flow through a very small um, opening. We call it atomizer. Yeah? So this will atomize, will sp spray the liquid into very, very small, tiny droplets, okay? surrounded by uh, hot air, about 200 over degrees Celsius. So if we want to produce this kind of, you know, uh, effect, the liquid can flow and it can be sprayed easily. So the viscosity of the liquid at this point, when it come out from the atomizer, the viscosity must be very low. 
can the viscosity can 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 start actually uh, at some high value, but the moment when the liquid flow through the atomizer, the liquid must be reduced so that the viscosity become very low and it can flow easily and atomize form a droplets. So again, this is one example of the flow behavior, the importance of flow behavior in the in the processing. Um, here in this factory, you can see this is a UHT process. Yeah? Ultra high temperature or maybe HTST, high temperature, short time process. So we have the heat exchanger here and the different, uh, we have a lot of pipelines here. So in this case, we, we will pump the liquid, uh, the liquid food to flow through this uh, pipeline. Sometimes the pipe is big, sometimes the, the pipe is small. So when, when the liquid flow through these different diameter of uh, pipelines, the viscosity of the liquid must be controlled so that it can flow easily. Yeah? And again, another example, pouring, dispensing of the, of the chocolate milk into the mold, spreading the spread or margarine or whatever. So all these actually relate to the how the material flows. Okay. So now uh, we want to discuss more about flow behavior. Yep. Okay. Now, when the liquid flow, whether through the pipeline or whether through the uh, you know, during the spray drying process. Or when we spread the, the 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 say the margarine or whatever on the toast, when we pour the liquid, the the sample or the material is subjected to a different amount of shear stress. So in this case, we use the term shear stress, yeah, because the so when, when the liquid flow through this uh, small hole, actually the liquid is subjected to a shear stress and the corresponding shear rate. Okay? And the, the, the amount of shear rate is different. Yeah? This is a very high shear rate process because we, the, the liquid is pumped through the, through the atomizer at a very high shear rate okay? so that it can form a small droplet. This one may be relatively lower compared to this one. When the liquid flow through the pipeline, can you imagine the shear rate is relatively very high because it will flow and subjected to a shear process. Yeah? Dispensing of the liquid, yeah? how, how, uh, what is the shear stress and the shear rate, uh, corresponding shear rate in this process? So we, we, ha we must have some idea What is the estimated shear rate? You can imagine uh, you can you can imagine shear rate as how fast the liquid flow. Yeah? When we apply the shear stress, the shear stress can be pumping, it can be stirring, it can be spraying, it can be spreading. Remember, the shear stress means we apply a stress, we apply a force in the shear mode. If you apply the stress in this mode, there is a normal stress. But in most uh, processing and uh, uh, food processing situation, we apply uh, the, the force or the stress in the form of shear stress. Then we get the corresponding shear rate. How fast the liquid moves? Yeah? If we just pour or if we just uh, we, we, we pump the liquid, so the rate, the rate at which the liquid or the fluid flow, so that is the shear rate. Remember, rate is always a function of time. Okay? So if we look at the, the different processes that normally uh, we normally encountered in food processing, 
sedimentation of powders in the liquid. The easiest example maybe, you know, if you have a starch suspension. Okay, starch suspension in water. So you leave it on the on the table. So in a few minutes time, you can see the starch will start to uh, precipitate. Due to what? what? What's pulling the starch particles to precipitate? The gravity. So the gravity in this case is, a, is, a, is, is one form of stress. Okay? But the shear rates, the, 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 the unit of shear rate is how, how do you pronounce that? S to the minus one reciprocal second. Yeah? So the unit of shear rate is reciprocal second. And you can see the shear rate during sedimentation process is 10 to the power of minus 6 to 10 to the power of minus 4. Can you imagine? It's a very, very, very slow process. Okay. Draining under gravity, 10 to the minus minus 1 to 100. Extruding. Extruding, when we force something out through an opening. You know, much um, when you, at home, um, uh, when you make this quay separate, uh, you put the, the dough inside and you just push it and it will come out. Another, pro perhaps, uh, maybe more familiar example, if you buy the if you go to McDonald's and buy the McDonald's ice cream, right? They put a cup there or the, the cone and the thing is just coming out. That is also the extruding process. And what is the shear rate here? About 10 to 100. Okay? 1 to 100. Chewing and swallowing. When you eat something, let, let, let's say the chewing gum and you chew, kunya. And when you swallow, when you swallow, it will go through this small passage or channel, and it will be squeezed into, you know, our stomach. So, and that's also uh, the the food when it goes inside through this. Uh, channel also will be, will be squeezed, so it will be subjected to shear rate. So chewing and swallowing, uh, surprisingly, quite high. The shear rate quite high. Coating, yeah? when we coat something, when we pour, say, a chocolate, uh, liquid chocolate in, on, on the cake to, to coat the cake, for example. So that also uh, has a relatively high shear rate. Mixing, yeah? depending on the type of mixer that we use. Stirring is actually a kind of mixing. But if we use the mixer, like that uh, high-speed mixer, that is a shear sure rate. Pipe flow. Spraying and brushing, very high, up to 10 to the power of 4. Why is it important for us to, under, to, to know this, the different shear sure rates? How, how, do, how do we relate with the previous examples that uh, I showed in the previous slide? Anyone? Why is it important for us to know about the shear rate? Why is it important for us to know the different shear rate of the different processes that usually we found uh, in, in, in food processing? Sorry, again? So that we can get the, get the desired viscosity. The desired, so that we can get the desired viscosity. Um, okay, maybe I can, I, I can try to guide you. Um, how, how, how does knowledge about shear rates important when we formulate a product? Any, any, food, any kind of food product. Okay. 
ओके ओके द लास्ट पार्ट आई थिंक इज गुड वन बाय नोइंग द शेयर रेट ऑफ द ओके व्हेन 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 वी इन्वॉल्व इन प्रोडक्ट डेवलपमेंट व्हेन वी डू प्रोडक्ट डेवलपमेंट राइट वी शुड नो द प्रोडक्ट विल बी सब्जेक्टेड टू व्हाट काइंड ऑफ प्रोसेसिंग इन द फैक्ट्री ओके सो इफ इफ यू नो द प्रोडक्ट वुड गो थ्रू different types of equipment different types of uh, maybe it will go through maybe mixing it will go through uh, maybe dispensing into a mold it will go through pump through the pipeline so later we will see uh, when, when we learn more about flow behavior the viscosity of the of the of the food of the sample will be different at different point of the processing depending on the shear rate of the process because um, some food some sample will start with a certain viscosity but when we subject to some of this uh, process at different shear rate the viscosity will change okay the viscosity will change this is the non newtonian type material I'm sure you have watched the the video. Uh, if if the material has a Newtonian behavior, we don't worry, because the 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 viscosity would not change, regardless of the shear rate that we use in the process, right? But if the if the material has a non Newtonian a non Newtonian type behavior, the zero plastic or shear thinning behavior, uh, that is when we need to. understand more about the different shear rate or the different type of processes um, that the food or the sample or the product will be subjected to okay now um, in order to in order to determine a viscosity how viscous of of the product the viscosity of the product uh, we cannot just simply look Up in, just uh, look the sample, and we can say, "Oh, the viscosity is this much." Uh, is is some very subjective. So we need to use an instrument. So the instrument that we can use to measure viscosity, there are a few different types. This one is called. This one is called, what? Visco meter, okay, and this one. is called rio now what is the difference or what are the differences between this cometer and a rio meter both can measure viscosity okay that is the the common the commonalities the the persamaan both can measure viscosity but how do they differ from each other what are the, the differences between viscometer and a rheometer okay there is something for you maybe you want to note down and find the answer i'm not going to give you the answer yet yeah. okay yeah. yet yeah. but both can measure viscosity so what do we do to measure viscosity using the instrument very simple for this is the <coughs> we can use a beaker or any kind of container then we can put the, the the sample in this case maybe a liquid form then we have a spindle here yeah we have a spindle connected to the 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 motor So the motor actually will this the spindle will rotate just like we stir the the liquid yeah but uh this is connected to the to the motor and the torque yeah the torque will be measured the torque is basically just uh, uh measure the amount of stress imposed on the sample and from there 
by using simple calculation, it will be converted to stress and strain or stress and shear rate. Shear stress and shear rate. That's how simple we can, uh, we can uh, measure a viscosity by using a viscometer. Most uh, labs um, in, in food industry would have at least this kind of viscometer to measure viscosity. It's not very expensive. Maybe the high-end one, maybe at least about 10,000 we can get one. Yeah? Um, but the more expensive one on the right is called rheometer. The cheapest one maybe about quarter a million. <laughs> we have two in, in our lab. So we don't let the students handle until their final year. Because who wants to be responsible if you damage 250,000? And the other one uh, upstairs, the other type of rheometer, about 300 something thousand. <laughs> so we have to be very careful. But the same thing, we have, we have uh, a geometry here. It can be, uh, you know, it, it will have a different diameter depending on the viscosity of the sample. For a very low viscosity, the diameter of this spindle would be, we should use a bigger diameter. For a very viscous sample, we can use a small diameter uh, geometry. So we put a sample here. Okay, I tell you one, one, one of the, 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 the difference between viscometer and rheometer. The rest you find yourself, okay? Uh, for a viscometer, usually we need quite a large amount of sample. Yeah? But for a rheometer, we can use a very small or very little amount of sample. We don't need very much. Maybe one milliliter or two milliliter or less. Yeah? So we put a sample on the platform here and we put the geometry. Let the, uh, we uh, uh, bring down the geometry to touch the sample, adjust the gap, and we can heat up the sample. So this is actually a, a heating mechanism. We can increase the temperature if we want to know how the viscosity changes with temperature. Yeah, if you're interested to know how the viscosity changes with temperature. And we can record the data in real time on a computer. It's so simple. You can measure viscosity of a sample in one minute or less. This one also quite simple, but this one will give you more information. Okay? What kind of information? Another difference between viscometer and a rheometer, if we use a rheometer, we can apply a shear stress from zero up to whatever value that we want to use. Okay, now I'm telling you what some of the differences already. Okay. But for a viscometer, you still can do that, but it's not that simple. You have to change the geometry to get a differential rate and, and so on. It can be done, but not that simple. The simplest one is by using a rheometer, but of course it's more expensive. Not many factories can afford to, buy, to have, yeah? but for research lab, we can have this type. So, um, to, to understand or to characterize the flow behavior of any type of uh, product, or any type of samples, we can use a rheometer or viscometer. So basically, uh, I go back. So basically, we put the sample there. Then we can start from zero, shear stress, then we increase the shear stress. Imagine that when you, when you stir the water in a cup or in a container, you start with very slow, then faster, then faster, then faster, 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 faster. So the same thing also, when we use the instrument, we can increase from zero shear stress up to maybe 100 or 1,000. 
then we measure the corresponding shear rates. Okay, then we get a curve. Or it can be straight line, it can be a curve, but we call them all, all of them curve. A flow curve, all these are flow, we call it flow curve. A flow curve is a, is a plot of shear stress against shear rate. That is a flow curve. Or we can also plot viscosity on the y-axis, shear rate on the x-axis, or viscosity on the y-axis, or shear stress on the x-axis. So on the x-axis, it can be shear stress or shear rate. On the y-axis, can be viscosity. Or shear stress on the y-axis, shear rate on the x-axis. All of them we call flow curve. And remember, the unit of stress is Pascal, Newton per meter square, or Pascal. And the unit of shear rate is Pascal second. I'm sorry, the, the unit of shear rate is reciprocal second. Nobody corrected me. <laughs> Just now I, I said the unit of shear rate is Pascal second, right? Wrong. That is the unit of viscosity. The unit of shear rate is reciprocal second. Now, so we start from zero, then we increase the shear stress. So at any shear stress, we measure the shear rate. Okay. Then we plot the graph. Then we now have one, two, three, four, five. At least six, eh, five different types of flow curve, or six different types of flow behavior. The simplest one is the straight line. The straight line goes through origin, zero, zero. And this, is, this type of flow behavior is called Newtonian. Newtonian. What is the meaning of straight line? Goes through origin. So if we write in, in an equation for this one, it would be y equal to mx. M is the slope, right? That's the simplest equation to describe this straight line. Meaning that when we increase the shear rate, there will be a proportional increase in shear rate. Yeah? So there's a proportional relationship, direct relationship. If we take, if we take any point on this curve, we can read what is the shear stress here, and we can read what is the shear rate here. So basically, that uh, if we take any two point and we get the slope for this line, and that will give us the viscosity. Okay, so the for for a Newtonian fluid or Newtonian behavior, any point on this curve when we measure when we calculate the viscosity the viscosity will be constant. Okay? The viscosity will be constant because it's a straight line. So Newtonian behavior means there is a direct relationship between shear stress and shear rate, and the viscosity is constant at any shear rate. So if I take this shear rate, I can read what is the viscosity. If I take this shear rate, I can read what is the viscosity, but it will be the same. It will be the same at a particular temperature. At a particular temperature, at a fixed temperature. When we increase the temperature, of course, the viscosity will change. When we increase the temperature, the viscosity will increase or decrease? Hmm? When we increase the temperature, become hotter, the, the viscosity will 
increase or decrease? Decrease. Let me see how many say, how many of you will say when we increase the temperature, viscosity will decrease? Hey? When we increase the temperature, the viscosity will decrease. What about others? When we increase the temperature, the viscosity will increase. How many? Raise your hand who say the, when we increase the temperature, the viscosity will increase. How many of you not sure? <laughs> when we increase the temperature, the viscosity will increase or decrease? Decrease. Huh? decrease. There's an inverse relationship, not direct relationship between viscosity and temperature. Even for Newtonian fluid, okay? Don't get confused. For a Newtonian fluid, at any shear rate, the viscosity is constant, doesn't change. So we can say that, we can, we can say this statement. For a Newtonian fluid, the viscosity is independent of shear rate. Independent of shear rate. Means that at any shear rate, the viscosity will still be the same, will still be constant. Okay. What about other type of flow behavior? Now we have pseudoplastic, we have Bingham plastic, we have Kesson type plastic, and there are many different other plastic type behavior. Uh, here on this graph, I'll show, I, I, I'll show you only five types, but there, there are more. But this is more common one that we will come across or encounter in, our, in most of the food samples. And dilatant type. This is probably the least common. Very difficult to find a sample which display dilatant behavior. But the most common one, perhaps, is maybe Newtonian and pseudoplastic, and maybe Bingham and Kesson type plastic. Now, let's uh, think of some examples. Please give me some example. If you have watched that those two lectures, and maybe have, if you have read some articles, I hope you can give me the right answer. Give me a few examples of Newtonian. Uh, Newtonian, oops, Newtonian type behavior. Give me a few examples of Newtonian uh, fluid. Water. Yeah, the more the, the easier example is water. Honey? <laughs> Honey? Honey is Newtonian? Honey looks very viscous. Do you think honey is Newtonian? Oh, confident? Is it is there in the notes? On. Honey is viscous, yes, but it displays a Newtonian behavior. If you don't believe, then you can. Uh, get some honey sample and go to our lab and measure and get the flow curve
and you will find you will get a straight when you plot shear stress against shear rate you will get this type of flow behavior so honey water these are two common examples of Newtonian more examples for Newtonian sorry oil vegetable oil okay fruit juice ah, okay fruit juice fruit juice yes it is Newtonian but when you say fruit juice we have to be uh, uh, more careful a normal fruit juice yes it will display Newtonian behavior but if we have a, um, a viscous quite viscous type of uh, fruit juice especially if we have concentrate it you remove some water and make it more concentrate and if we measure put on the rheometer or viscometer and get the shear stress against plot the shear stress against shear rate it may it may show slight pseudoplastic behavior so a viscous juice concentrate may display pseudoplastic behavior because in fruit juice we have some soluble gums soluble hydrocolloids you learn we learn about hydrocolloids in food ingredients actually we don't learn much yet except you read something but we have a soluble pectin in the in the in the juice so when we concentrate we remove some water in the juice so the pectin in the in the juice also will become more concentrated and it can display a slight pseudoplastic behavior not really not true not a true uh, Newtonian behavior so um, generally if we have if the sample contain only a small molecular weight components like honey it looks viscous but actually it has high concentration of sugar small molecular small molecule sugars fructose glucose yeah so although honey look viscous but actually when we determine the the flow behavior it will show Newtonian type but things like fruit juice normal fruit juice should display Newtonian but uh, the more concentrated fruit juice would display a, a pseudoplastic behavior or non-Newtonian non type so all this pseudoplastic, Bingham plastic, Gasson type plastic and dilatant together they are known as non-Newtonian meaning that the non-Newtonian simply means at any point here if we take this point take that point take that point the viscosity actually the, the, the value of viscosity is actually different or changes as a function of shear rate so we can we can make a statement for non-Newtonian type fluids the viscosity is dependent of dependent on shear rate for Newtonian the viscosity is independent of shear rate meaning that when we increase the shear rate the viscosity still maintain the same value but for non-Newtonian non type pseudoplastic, dilatant, uh, Bingham plastic and so on when we increase the shear rate the viscosity also will change the viscosity will change whether it will increase or it will decrease okay for pseudoplastic type pseudoplastic type when we increase the shear rate there is a corresponding there is a more than proportional increase in the shear rate so when we measure the viscosity at each point we will find that when we increase the shear rate the viscosity actually will decrease so in, in uh, another terms for pseudoplastic is called shear thinning shear thinning meaning that as you increase the shear the, 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 the product or the sample will become thinner thinner means the viscosity will actually reduce 
On the other hand, dilaton is actually shear thickening, meaning that when you increase the shear rate, the viscosity actually will, will, will increase. So dilaton is the opposite of pseudo plastic. But in food, in food, uh, in 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 uh, our food, uh, the uh, food processing of uh, the example for our food samples, uh, there are not many examples of food which display dilaton behavior, but more actually uh, showing pseudoplastic, Newtonian, or Bingham plastic or Kesson type. Chocolate melt. The chocolate in the melt in the melted form would display usually the Kesson type behavior, or maybe sometimes Bingham plastic depending on how much uh, fat, how much sugar in the chocolate milk. So the types of ingredient in the product would determine whether the sample would display plastic or Bingham plastic or Kesson type plastic. We, we do not know. We wouldn't know until we put the sample on the rheometer, increase the shear stress, measure the shear rate, plot, and then only we can tell whether it will show this type of flow behavior. So for this topic on food rheology, on the viscosity, understanding the flow behavior is one of the very important aspect because that will help us to relate the formulation of the food and later how it will behave during the processing. When we subject the food to different types of equipment, different type of different different um, degree of shear rates. Okay. So Newtonian, non-Newtonian. Now <laughs> to make things a little bit more complicated, not much more, a little bit more complicated. Non-Newtonian behavior can be divided into time-independent and time-dependent. Now, let me warn you here, this can be a bit confusing, but if you really you know, uh, try to understand, then it's not that confusing. Time-dependent and time-independent. Understand this this. This, the difference between these two also is important because uh, it will affect how the material behaves during processing, during application. But before that, let's make it clear about the definition. So I think by now, we have seen what is the meaning of Newtonian, right? So this is just uh, to make it clear in the form of sentence. The viscosity of the fluid is dependent only on temperature, but independent of time and shear rate. In other words, the viscosity of Newtonian fluid at different shear rate will be constant. But at different temperature, of course, the viscosity will change. It will decrease. Independent of time. What's the meaning of independent of time? Imagine that you stir a sample in a cup or in a beaker. You shear the sample at constant shear, at constant shear rate, at a fixed shear rate. One minute. Measure the viscosity, x. 10 minutes, after 10 minutes, continue to stir. After 10 minutes, measure the viscosity. The viscosity will change or not? No, constant. One hour, do you think the viscosity, viscosity will change or not? No. And you can continue how long? Still, the viscosity would be constant. So that's the meaning of Newtonian, the viscosity of Newtonian is independent of time and shear rate. Okay? And for non 
Um, yeah, for this line actually should go through zero zero. But what happens actually? Uh, I prepared this PowerPoint in Windows PC, but when I play on my Mac, laggy sikit eh? But it, this is uh, the the correct way of drawing this is this one should go through zero. Yeah, but um, at any point, if you take this point, take that point. Uh, before that, yeah. So you take any point of this and calculate the viscosity. It will be constant. So for Newtonian, the viscosity is independent of shear rate. But when we carry out the same experiment, but now at different temperature, T1, T2, T3. So we can see if we measure the viscosity along this line, it will give you T1 temperature. Uh, T1. At T1 temperature, it will give you one value of viscosity. When you measure at T2 temperature, it will give you one value of viscosity, T3. But you will see that the temperature would uh, re decrease, will decrease as a function as you increase the temperature. Okay. So that is very important part. And if I measure the viscosity at different shear rate at a given temperature, okay, the viscosity will be constant. Remember, because for Newtonian, the viscosity is constant at any given, at any shear rate. But the, the, when, you, when we increase the temperature, in this case, the, the T3 is higher than T2, higher than T1. Eh? So the viscosity at higher temperature is lower than the viscosity at uh, Sorry, yeah. The viscosity at higher temperature is lower than viscosity at lower temperature. So, so the viscosity is a function of temperature for Newtonian or even for non-Newtonian fluid as well. So I hope this is clear, at least uh, up to this point. And before we stop, other soalan, any question? This part is clear. I think uh, if you still not clear, go back to the recorded lecture and if you still don't understand throw a question on your modo and let your friends answer the questions okay i'll see you tomorrow for imk221 food ingredients okay thank you